Church in Forked River, New Jersey, and it's good to have you with us because we're starting a brand new series this evening, and it's a study on the Bhagavad Gita of Sri Krishna, and uh, we're going we're gonna to start it right off here from scratch, and we're beginning right at the very foundation of this, and then each week as we go along, we will uh, explore it deeper and deeper, and I think you'll get wisdom gleaned out of this thing, which will probably be, uh, well, probably some of the most rich wisdom that you've ever heard. It's, it's interesting if people will, you know, listen to teachers, and even including myself, but the wisdom that will flow out of this document uh, is beyond anything you could ever hope to hear. But we have to start at the base of it. You will receive the document in uh, photocopied sheet form, the sheets, maybe one or two sheets that we'll do that night. So you'll have all of the scripture and verses directly from this translated version of the Bhagavad Gita that you may be able then to keep these things. Because it's, uh, the, some of the sayings in there are, are just really rich, beautiful. What is it? What are we talking about? The Bhagavad Gita of Sri Krishna. Well, it's the, probably the greatest devotional book of Hinduism is what we're talking about. And so here in, 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 in this Christian society and uh, element that we live in, we're going to open a book on Hinduism and take a look at it. And what we're, what's going to surprise us is just how it molds and folds itself prayerfully right into an integration with Christianity and with Jesus Christ. Okay? What this is known as, it is known as the Song of the Lord. That's what the Bhagavad Gita is. The Song of the Lord. Okay? Song of the Lord or the Gospel of the Lord Shri Krishna. S-H-R-I-K. You want to spell K-R-I-S-H-N-A for our um, dealings, it's okay. But in, in, in most of the places where the people do it a little deeper, it's K-R-S-N-A. Either way, it's okay. It's no we'll cool over that. Dates about 500 B.C., approximately. Could be a little older, give a, a couple of years one way or the other. Who cares? It's irrelevant, but it's an old one. We're talking about 500 to 1,000 years before Jesus was born, this wisdom was flowing through the minds of, of mankind from God. Now, what's the story about? I gave you a little uh, opening uh, slip of paper there that you could get an idea, but it tells the story of the Pandavas, P. A-N-D-A-V-A-S. And the Pandavas are five brothers. And what they symbolize are the five aspects of your divine personality. In other words, five aspects of that part of you that reaches out to lift yourself above the lower fourfold nature, the carnal nature, to reach up into the bosom of God, nirvana, the higher consciousness, okay? In other words, these five brothers, the five Pandavas, are you. They equal you. In fact, everything in the Bhagavad Gita is about you. It's about what goes on in your mind. The, the good guys are over here and the bad guys. Both we have uh, active in our, in our uh, psyche, okay? And that's what it is. The leader of the Pandavas is a person <coughs> excuse me, by the name of Arjuna, A-R-J-U-N-A. -A. Very, very prominent character. He carries the ball throughout the entire play, if you want to call it this, or the entire drama, Arjuna. Okay. And Arjuna is your personality, your divine personality. In other words, your divine personality, that part of you that seeks to be in a oneness with Christ, is given the name Arjuna for the sake of this allegory, for the sake of this, this story. Does it mean it was really an Arjuna? That's irrelevant as it is in the Bible. It means it stands for an aspect of your mind, an aspect of your personality. One of the other brothers, Y-U-D-H-I, I'm going to have to really spell some of these things, so... Deal with me, S-H-T-I-R-A, and Yudi Shtra is the spirit mind. Spirit mind. These are all the good guys. Five brothers are all the good guys. These are the ones you bring with you when you're finally able to, on a Tuesday night, reach that meditative state and you rise up into the bliss of God. These five are with you, 
okay? Generally, when you're working, day-to-day -day working, generally when you're, you know, colliding with the world or in whatever difficulties you may be, you're colliding with the other four, okay? Who's the other one? Bhima, B-H-I-M-A. That's your divine intellect. Wisdom, understanding. We got your, we got your, your personality, your divine personality. We got your spirit mind. We got your intellect. And now we've got uh, Nakula, N-A-K-U-L-A, N-A-K-U-L-A, which is love of goodness, good things. Okay. And finally, the five brothers, Sahedva, S-A-H-A-D-E-V-A, truth, S-A-D-A-V-E-A, -A -A, whatever. Truth, love of truth. So here we have the good guys, our divine personality, our spirit mind, our intellect, love of goodness, love of truth. They represent the Pandavas. You'll find as the story goes along, they are also referred to as the sons of Pandu, P-A-N-D-U. Same thing, okay, sons of Pandu. Now what happens here is the same thing that happens to all of us, and what occurs is carried in the Bible as the story of the prodigal son. They lose their father. They're separated from, their father is dead. In other words, there is no divine activity. See, we have these aspects within us, but where are they going to go? See, when you're going to church all of your life and you're coming in and you're hearing the Bible or you're singing the songs, these aspects are within you, but they're not going anywhere. They're, they're dormant. We were talking a little bit about the pineal gland, the vestige. It's, it's not doing anything. So their father is dead. Well, their, their, their father is actually the right hemisphere of the brain within you, the divine consciousness. It's not used anymore. You use the left side, you're content with it because nobody ever told you there's a right side. Nobody ever told you you could activate the right side. Your father is dead. So what happens then to the five brothers? What happens to the divine, the five good aspects, the five divine aspects of you if your father is dead? Well, you are raised then by King, his, his name is so long, can't even spell it, Drishtarashtra, who is what? The blind king. Do you see what happens here? Your heavenly father is dead because you know nothing about the fact that he dwells within you, and so you are raised by your uncle, who is what? The blind king. What's that mean? It's your mind. Very well intentioned. Tries to do the best it can. But what's it usually do? Leads you into a ditch because it's blind. As Jesus said, one blind person leads another blind person, they both fall into a ditch. The blind person wants very hard to show you the pathway as to where you can reach your goal, but he can't see it, so he falls into a ditch and you fall into a ditch right after him. There's the blind king. And do you see how the book, how, how this is being put together? The divine aspects, we've lost your father, you have no knowledge of the divine kingdom within you, and so you are following the blind king, you are following that part of your mind, the carnal aspect of your mind, which is well-intentioned, but blind. That's, where the, that's basically where the story starts of the Bhagavad Gita. What? Sure. B-H-A-G-A-V-A-D-G-I-T-A. Okay? You got it. So when your nature is separated from the Father, what happens? You are led by human instinct, the lower consciousness, the blind king. See, that's why Jesus healed the blind. What did he, he went around healed them, healing the blind. So you could see. Which means you are lifted above that which is the lower mind, raised up to a higher divine mind, and you are set free. So these are the ones we just talked about, the sons of Pandu, the Pandavas, the five brothers, are the good guys. Now, the blind king has 100 sons. A myriad of trouble. And you've, 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 you've met most of them. In fact, you probably have met all of them at one time or another. There's anger and deceit and disgust and all of this stuff. There's all the brothers. There's tons of them. Every day you meet another brother. And of course, they are the favorites of the blind king. 
you know. Because after all, they are the offspring. All of this, if we call this trouble, okay, if we call this trouble, then we understand that these are the offspring of the blind king. Where is he, how is he going to show them the way? He can't see. Okay. So that's how they're raised. They're raised in ignorance because where are you going to go? See, I mean, your, your religions are very well intentioned. They want you to be good. You know, they want you to be holy. They want you to go to heaven. The problem is they don't know where heaven is. See? So where, where are they going to take you? Go to heaven. Where is it? Up there. How do I get there? You've got to die. <laughs> what good is this? <laughs> See, they're blind. Do you understand what's this? This is a magnificent document. And it just gets better and better and better and better as you go deeper and deeper into it. It's really great. But what this basically is, is you have the sons of Pandu, the Pandavas, which are light, and you have the hundred sons and the blind king, darkness. It's the old darkness against light. The Zoroastrian philosophy of how can darkness live and coexist with light. So the sons of Pandu are light, and the sons of the blind king are darkness. Look at page 170 in your little Bibles, and go to 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, okay? If you thought that you gained a lot of wisdom out of the study of Buddha, and we did, you'll, 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 you'll just go crazy with this because it's just filled with wisdom and understanding, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And let's just put here, okay, right up here we'll put that the Pandavas are light and the sons of the blind king dark, okay. Now if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, let's go to verse 14. Paul says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with righteousness? What communion has light with darkness? Oh, that, 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 I'll tell you something. That is not an original thing with the Apostle Paul. It's not an original thing with Judaism. It's not an original thing with Christianity. It is an original thing with Zoroastrianism. That's where it came from. It came from Iran. The first one to preach the, the battle between light and darkness was Zoroaster, the Persian prince, the Iranian king. Zoroaster was the chief prince of the tribe of Magi, who were the ones dispatched to identify Jesus Christ. And I always find that to be amazingly strange, you know, that God, whomever this is, would pick a group of astrologers, also magicians from Iran, to make the great announcement. <laughs> great, you know. Everything that Christianity is scared to death of, God said, you guys go and tell them about it. So he sends the magi from Iran, of all places, to make the big announcement, okay. So there's the constant struggle between the two families. And the story goes on. The blind king gives land, some land, to uh, the Pandavas. Okay, what, what are we saying here? Your mind gives you that aspect of your life. You, 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 you feel now that you have arrived. Okay? This is what all that I want. All that I want in my life is this. You know? I want a car. I want a house. I want to get married. I want to have kids. Every one of those things, after a period of time, becomes a disaster. The house has got termites. The car is throwing a rod. The kids are screaming, ah, I don't want any of it. But these things you get, see, so, oh, let me have all of this stuff, and this is what I want. Well, along comes one of these rascals who are the hundred sons. His name is Durdham, D U R Y O D. D U R Y O D H A N A. This guy is a red. He's the, he's the leader of the bad guys. He is known by his middle name, Deceit. Deceit. He's the deceiver. Sorry. Deceiver. He is the evil principle of desire. It is desire which deceives you into thinking that what you want is really going to help your life until you get it and you find it 
that may be the thing that actually destroys you. So here he is. This is our boy, Durant Hanna. He is the sire. He is deceit. So he's, he's the son of the blind king. Now what has happened? The human mind, your mind and my mind, has gotten to a point of being pretty excited about what we're going to have. Our new car, our, our, our new job, our new friends, all of these things that we want, see? Now here comes the desire of the lower mind, that which is the deceiver in the lower mind, and something is going to happen. It's going to screw us up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to wind up just like it always does wind up. Watch what happens. During Hana, this evil principle gets Yod Histerah. Now, who is Yod Histerah? If you look in the back of this thing, maybe you can keep the, the cast of characters. Yod Histerah is the first. The spirit mind. Say, what does he do with the spirit mind? He gets him in a dice game. Say, deceit gets your spirit to gamble away its rightful heritage in order to try to get more. If you think it's a little bit like Esau and Jacob, it is. That's where the story of Jacob and Esau came from. The spirit is deceived into gambling away its heritage. Oh, and how many of us have done this? See, we have been deceived. We've been deceived by churches. We've been deceived by preachers. We've been deceived by religion. We've been deceived by our parents. We've been deceived by our friends. And they still do it. Say, come, don't go down there. Come up to us. We have the truth and all of this stuff and all of these blind people that gather around and try to show us the way and so forth. So you gamble your life. You gamble nirvana. You gamble that which is divine consciousness. You gamble it away because you are consumed by the lower mind. You are consumed by your desires to do things. You are consumed and deceived by feelings that you have, traditions that you have. You don't want to offend it. All of these things are Duradhana. And so Duradhana cheats at the dice game. The lower mind deceives our spirit, and we lose ourselves. Look at page 549 in your little Bibles, and the rest of you go to Book of Proverbs. Okay? Proverbs. And let's look at Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. And let's go to verse 5. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. And, and, and the counsels of the wicked are not wicked people. They're wicked thoughts. Those are the things that have done. Think of all the things in your life that have been screwed up, that you were sure were going to bring you happiness. <laughs> <laughs> you lost the dice, you know. You rolled the snake eyes. And the dice were loaded anyhow. He had a little bit of stuff in him, so they weren't going to roll the right way. No way you could roll a seven when you're playing with this guy. The only time you can roll a seven is when you roll it up above. You cannot roll a seven. You're always going to roll snake eyes when you play dice with this guy. That's what the Bhagavad Gita is telling you. If you want to gamble, then you're going to lose because his dice are loaded. What that's saying, what the Bhagavad Gita is saying, if you gamble away, this which is your divine mind, your divine meditation, it's no gamble. You're going to lose. Definitely going to lose. Okay. So you cannot win. It's impossible because the game is fixed. Okay? Look at, look at page 31 in your little Bibles, and the rest of you go to the book of Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. And verse 30, 35. This is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. We are quick to gamble with our desire nature to make things come out right, but our desire nature is a deceiver, and we're going to be cheated. We're going to lose. And there is a particular symbolic statement there that even gambling away the covering of Christ, trying our best to figure out how we're going to survive in this world, and we're playing against somebody that's got a loaded dice. 
What happens here? Oh, we lose our spirit mind is lost. And Duradhana, which is the seat of the lower mind, forces the Pandavas, forces the good essence of us to go into exile for 13 years. 1, 3 equals 4. That's our fourfold nature going into bondage. Lost the whole doggone thing. And most of you have been in exile a heck of a lot longer than 13 years. So, because you played with it. You gambled with it. You got, you got chopped up. You played with somebody who's got a loaded dice. And your fourfold nature came into the bondage of the system. And you're out of it. But now, all of a sudden, here you found something going on within you. All of your life. Let me tell you something. This is a story about all of us so far. We all lost. And we all found ourselves in bondage. We all found ourselves in the wilderness. We had nothing. And we groped around, and then suddenly something stirred within you. The 13 years ended. In other words, you started to feel something drawing your fourfold nature back. Back, and you started challenging the blind uncle, the blind king. You said, I want what's mine back. That's why you're sitting here. You are sitting here because you have gone to the blind king and said, I want mine back. I want what's rightly mine back. It was stolen from me by the deceiver. I want it back. Okay? That's why you're sitting in the chairs that you're sitting in. Well, Duradhana, our lower nature, wants nothing whatsoever to do with your divine nature that's saying, I want this back. And your carnal mind is saying, don't get involved in this. Your friends are saying, don't get involved in this. No, 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 don't get, in, don't get into this stuff. Everybody at one stage or the other has told you all of the evil that goes on down in this room. Oh, they sacrifice animals. The, oh, they take pot, they do drugs, all of these wild things. And they're all said by the, by the preachers. By the preachers. See. Because Duradhana wants not to give you your rightful heritage. Because if you get your rightful heritage back, then you'll have control of something. And you are not to have control of something. You are to be obliged to them. Stay with nothing. Stay out of the way. Now, there's another fellow here who enters into the scene now. And his name is Sanjaya, S-A-N-J-A-Y-A, S-A-N-J-A-Y-A, OK? And what he is, he's the chariot driver for the blind king. He is your human instinct. He knows what's right. And he tries in some way, shape, or form to, to get you on the right track. But he doesn't know how to do it. See? I know this is right. And I know that this other way is wrong. I know I got gypped. I know I got cheated. But what do I do with this? How do I get this life turned around? Go to page 148 in the Little Bibles. And you'll find on Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Okay, Here's Sanjaya, your instinct. He is trying to intercede for you, so to speak. He's trying to say, you know, What's happened here is wrong. And, and there's something inside of me is telling me that I should, I should have a way of getting this back what's mine. I should have a, a right. I've got some rights here, but what do I do? See, here's, here's what he said. Look at Romans chapter 7 and go to verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. In other words, the things I'm doing I know are wrong. For what I would, that do I not. In other words, the things that I should do, I don't know how to do. I can't do. But what I hate, that's what I do. That's Sanjaya. That's Sanjaya. He's saying, this isn't right. But I don't know what I can do about it. There must be a better way. Okay. Look at what it says in Romans 7, verse 22, where you are. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. See? See? Not the law of God 
after the Bible that's in your hand, not the law of God after the church that you go to, not the law of God after the rules and regulations they shove down your throat. I delight in the law of God after that which is within me. That's what it says. And so that's what Sanjaya's problem is. I see, look at verse 23 of Romans 7. But I see another law in my members warring against the law and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin. That's Duradhana. See, I see something else that's got control of me that won't let me have what's mine. And you all see that. You've all known that. You, you can sit right here and stare at me and you know that. Because where are you going? Where are you going? You're going to get old. Things start to run down. And then that's it. Where are you, you going to go? You're going to die. Where are you going? You're going to Neptune, Pluto, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Just sit here, eat fruit, have a bagel once in a while, go to the bathroom, a little sex once in a while, go down to Atlantic City and die. I say, well, what else is there? Huh? That's it. That's all I get. And do you know what? You can go and they're in the nursing homes and they're walking around the streets by the millions like zombies. They don't know. All they're trying to do is keep alive. They go to doctors every day. Every day they go. I don't feel good here. This ain't so hot. I don't like this. I can't see like I used to. I don't. What, what am I going to do? Give you a shot. Take a pill. Take two pills. Here, take three pills. If you don't like those, take these pills. But keep taking the other pills. Goes on and on and on. For what? Because no per no reason. Why are you giving so many pills for the person to keep alive? I don't know. What else? To stay alive. And yet nobody can stay alive. But they keep giving you the pills. <laughs> because there's no purpose. There's no reason for all of this. No way of understanding all of this. Okay? So here then, Durdhana decides, your desire and agent says, you're not getting this back. I am going to go to war with you. And there is all hell going to break loose right in here. There is going to be all hell breaking loose. Now, there's more intervention here. Here comes Bhishma, B-H-E-E-S-H-I-M-A, B-H-E-E-S-H-I-M-A. Here's another intervention from your, this Bhishma is your lower, your, your lower intellect, wisdom, consciousness. Now, see, first of all, your instinct said you were not being treated right. I almost said something. Now, you're mind, your intellect starts to say, something's wrong here. You know, I had a feeling that this, I shouldn't be living this way. There's something more to life than this. Now, all of a sudden, you might start reading something. You might have turned on the television, seen the screwball, like me, on his saying, say, hey, what the heck, this sounds like it might be pretty good. Maybe I'll try this crazy stuff. Oh, I don't know. What? I'll try anything. Wisdom. This is Bichma starting to intercede. And again, your desire says, no, I won't let you go. Durudhama says no. And then finally, Lord Krishna, the divine impulse speaks within. But you're still. Desire says no. It's not going to let you go. There's going to have to be a confrontation. There's going to have to be a battle. And so the rival families are faced with no other way out. Pandavas. Right. Sons of the blind king, because I can't spell the guy's name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know that. The line is drawn, okay? This is what's going on inside of you, and what many of you have found raging with it. The battle lines are drawn. This, in the Bible, is known as Armageddon. That's Armageddon when the right side unleashes its fury and the left side responds. So the families face, face each other on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. That's the prelude. On the battlefield of light versus darkness is where the Bhagavad Gita begins. On the battlefield of light versus darkness is where your life really begins. All the rest of it was seeking to find life, seeking 
to follow the leader, finally coming to grips with the fact that you were being deceived, then coming back to claim what is yours as you are here now, finally not able to overcome the desires, not able to overcome the thoughts of the mind, you find yourself with a battle line drawn, you are going to have to go against this in combat. Going to have to fight. Right. Now, Prince Arjuna, your personality, surveys the battlefield. You can see, it's a beautiful drama. He comes out and he surveys the battlefield and he is caught up with overwhelming sorrow. And here we are. Why does this have to be? Why, you know, my body, my mind, why should this be an enemy to me? I mean, and how am I going to turn and go against the very thing that I've loved and has supported me, myself, my, my ego, my being, my, my, my name, my traditions? Why do I have to fight? Why do I have to kill those very things? What's the purpose of all of that? Why does this have to be done in order for me to find? Why can't I just somebody tell me and lift me up? Why can't I just be happy? Why can't I just become divine? Why do I have to go through all of this conflict with myself in order to arrive at nirvana? Why? And here Arjuna then, in looking over the battlefield, goes into a deep depression over the futility of war. Why? And then Krishna speaks. God speaks. Christ consciousness speaks to Arjuna. And their conversation is overheard by Sanjaya, the instinct. And Sanjaya, the instinct, begins to tell what was said to the blind king. Huh? What's happened here? Meditation. The Christ speaks within us, speaks within to our divine personality. And the words that come from on high start to come down into our lower instincts and fill our lower minds, and we begin to receive that which is God. That's just what this is about. It's not somebody overhearing what Krishna said to Arjuna and reporting it back to the blind king. It's the fact that these messages, these divine celestial impulses are coming down, being picked up by our divine personality, which is our Christ nature, given down unto our carnal nature, where that which is our instinct, our human instinct, begins to pick up on this. This is why all of a sudden you have a good idea. Wow, I know what I'm going to do. When you say, oh, I know what I'm going to do, Sanjaya has overheard, has picked up something that was said from Krishna to Arjuna, from the right side to your instinct. Because this is all the functioning of your mind. It is not uh, some kind of a play. And Sanjaya reports that he, what he heard back to the blind king, as I've said to you, and the battle then begins. The war is about to begin. The battle lasts 18 days. 18 days. 1 plus 8 equals 9. Again, just like the Bible, the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is telling you this is about consciousness. The number nine is a consciousness. It couldn't be 17 days, it couldn't be 15, 16, it had to be 18 because it has to be nine. Consciousness. See, Jesus was crucified, there was darkness on the earth from the sixth hour, which is works, denominations, doctrines, doing, until the ninth hour. New consciousness. The whole thing. The Bible from beginning to end is consciousness. The Bhagavad Gita is consciousness. Buddha is consciousness. Krishna is consciousness. Jesus is consciousness. Zara is consciousness. The whole thing is consciousness. Because what else is there? If there is no consciousness that is divine within you, then you've got what on the outside? Desire and trying to figure everything out and trying to succeed and being destroyed. So it's consciousness. At the end of the battle, all of the warriors are dead, except for Krishna and the five sons of Pandu. The Pandavas survive. Krishna survives. There is nothing left of all that has set about to hurt you. There is nothing left of the fear. There is nothing left of the sickness. There is nothing left of the hate. There is nothing left of the anger. All of that is dead. All that is alive within you is Christ consciousness and that which is your divine personality and your divine senses. The light overwhelms the darkness and is preserved with the divine mind. 
So we've, we've done the prelude. This is kind of a little bit like the, you know, before the show starts, they have the, uh, what do they call the overture. We've done the overture. The good part now begins next week when we get into the first part, which is the sorrow of Arjuna, see, in which Arjuna then speaks to Krishna and asks him to explain why. Why do you have to come? Why are you alive? What? Why must you kill out the aspects of your being? And, and can you kill them? And can you be I mean, what is it all about? What is life all about? What is the purpose? And then, you know what's amazing? That this is one of the most magnificent, most beautiful things ever set on paper in the history of the world. And you know what? Christianity, almost to a person, doesn't even know it exists. See? That's like having never seen the sun. It's like never, having never seen the sun, having never seen a star, don't even know they exist, having never seen a sunset, having never seen a, a, a dolphin, having never seen the ocean. That's what it's like. We have been, you talk about the communists, forget it. This is nothing compared to us. At least they put up a wall with them. I mean, with us, it you know, looks like it's all nice and we look like we understand everything. In fact, we're even told we're enlightened, we're saved. From what? We're saved from the truth, from peace from life. You'll learn so much, you'll be lifted so high by the words of the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you.